So now we're going to talk about buoyancy. Buoyancy is a force which an object that's immersed in a fluid feels. And it comes about because of the pressure gradient in the fluid. So if I have an object and I immerse it in a fluid, the pressure at the bottom of the object is going to be higher than the pressure pushing down on the top of the object. And so that produces a net force that acts upwards in the opposite direction to the object's weight. And this upwards force is what we call buoyancy. So in order to calculate this, let's go to a diagram on the computer. So here we have a small object immersed in a fluid, and this fluid has got div uh, density rho f. Now, if we look at the force um, acting on this object, then the net force is going to be the uh, pressure difference between the top and the bottom times the area. So the uh, net force will equal, um, and so we're assuming it's going to be upwards, so we'll say net force upwards, will be uh, PB minus PT, and then that's the pressure difference, that we have to multiply that by the area. Well, the area is going to be delta X times delta Z. And this here, of course, is just the pressure difference. And the pressure difference, as we know, because we've done the calculations in an earlier lecture for the static pressure in a uh, fluid, this is just equal to the density of the fluid times the gravitational field times the height difference, and in which case this is delta y. And we're assuming here that we've got a constant uh, density of uh, fluid. So if we put this in here, then our buoyancy force, or our net upwards force, is going to be the density of, and I should say actually this should be delta F, is going to be the uh, fluid density times the gravitational field times delta X, delta Y, delta Z. So this is our uh, uh, net force, and this of course is just going to be the fluid density times g times delta v, where this is our volume of the object. So this is fine for a small object, but supposing I want to find it for any object in general. Well, in that case, what I have to do is I have to integrate this up and find the total force acting on the object by integrating over the entire volume of the object. And so what I want to do is I want to take the limit as delta V goes to zero, and I want to integrate the force on each volume element, and I want to integrate that, so that's rho F G dv. So I integrate this over the entire uh, volume of the uh, object, and so what this is going to give me is that the total force, um, buoyancy force, is going to be equal to the density of the fluid times the gravitational field times the volume of the object. And my constant term here is going to be zero, because when I have zero volume, I have zero force. So this is my buoyancy force. But we want to interpret this in a, a more physical way. So let's rewrite that as rho f times v dotted with g. Well, this here is the mass of fluid displaced. Right? This is the density of the fluid multiplied by the volume of the object that's beneath the surface, right? Because I'm adding all these volume elements up. Right? So this is the mass of fluid that's been displaced, and this is of course G. So this is equal to the weight of displaced fluid.
Now, I have done a little bit of sleight of hand here when I did my integration because um, I didn't actually just integrate over the volume of the um, object. I integrated over the volume of liquid that's displaced because that's what's actually going on here. I'm not integrating over the volume of the uh, object. I'm integrating over the volume of liquid displaced. And there's a difference between these two. Supposing here this is my ship and I'm sailing through the water like this, right? Then the volume I'm integrating over is this volume here. Right? Even though the inside of the ship may be empty or mostly empty, um, you know, it still counts as part of the ship. I'm not just integrating it over the material in the hull, I'm integrating it over the total volume of fluid that is displaced. So this is the important region um, that you want to uh, uh, integrate over. Right? It's not the volume of the object, it's the volume of fluid that is displaced that you integrate over here. And so this gives you Archimedes' principle that the buoyancy force is equal to the weight of displaced fluid. Okay, so as we've seen from the computer, um, we have Archimedes' principle, and Archimedes' principle is, gives us a very simple way to determine whether an object will float. If the density of the fluid is greater than the density of the object, then the buoyancy force will be greater than the weight, and this will cause the object to rise to the top surface of the fluid. So what this means is that any object can float in a fluid that has a higher density than the object. So if we take a steel ball bearing, if we put that into water, of course, it will immediately sink to the bottom because the density of steel is a lot greater than the density of water. But if we had a fluid with a greater density than steel, then that steel ball bearing would actually float on the surface. And fortunately, nature gives us just such a fluid. It's mercury, which has a density almost 14 times that of water. And so here in this jar, because mercury is toxic, um, we can see a, uh, uh, at the bottom is filled with mercury. And floating on the surface, we have a steel ball bearing that you can see bobbing up and down as I move the jar. Now, in fact, mercury is so dense that it's even denser than lead. And so if I turn the jar around, here you can see a, a lead ball, and this too is floating on the surface of the mercury. So all that's needed for an object to float is a fluid that has a density greater than that of the object. OK, so we've seen how immersing an object in a fluid can exert a buoyancy force upwards on the object. But Newton's third law tells us that for every action, there must be an equal and opposite reaction. So what that means is that when I immerse an object in a fluid, there must be a downwards force, equal and opposite to the buoyancy, that is exerted on the fluid. And so here we have an apparatus to show you this in action. So what we have here is two balances. So we've got a balance at the top here, and we've got a balance vertically below it. And on the top balance, what we have is we have this, uh, you can see that it's actually in balance here, and we have a 200 gram weight suspended uh, beneath it. And so, you know, you can see we've got it set at 200 grams on the slider here. So we've got this system in balance. Now, on the bottom balance here, what we have is we have a beaker of water and I'm just going to get it, it's just in balance now, there. So we have a beaker of water in balance here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reattach this weight to the top balance, and we saw that that was perfectly balanced at the start, and we're going to see what happens when I immerse this weight in the water. And so you can see, even though the weight is not completely immersed, what has happened here is that the top balance is no longer in equilibrium, or it's no longer uh, uh, balanced. This side has got lighter and has moved up, whereas on the bottom here, we have this balance has moved down on this side, so there is clearly an additional force being exerted on this side of the balance, despite the fact that the weight is not touching 
the bottom nor is it touching the sides of the fluid and if I lift it out of the water you can see that this bottom balance goes into uh, uh, balance again but I add the weight to the water and it immediately goes out of balance and the reason for that is that when this weight displaces some of the water it raises the water level in the beaker which increases the downwards pressure on the bottom of the beaker and that's what throws the system out of balance um, but the downwards force that's exerted is equal and opposite to the buoyancy force so that Newton's third law is also satisfied so we've already seen how we can use the static pressure of a fluid that increases with depth of fluid to measure pressure. Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to use the phenomenon of buoyancy to measure the density of a fluid. And so what I have here is something called a hydrometer. And what it is, in this case it's a, uh, a glass tube with a metal weight at the end to hold it down and you can see that there's calibrations in the middle where you can read off in this case it's the density of the uh, um, liquid that it's going to be floating in now the way that this works is that when I drop this into a fluid it will float and the condition for floating is that the buoyancy force upwards exerted by the fluid will equal the weight of this object so since this object has a constant mass for a uh, particular fluid it must displace a volume of fluid which has the same mass as this object so if I put it in a, uh, a less dense fluid such as methanol it's going to have to displace more volume of liquid because methanol has got a lower density and so therefore a larger volume is needed to give the same mass as this object if I place it however in water water is more dense than methanol and so it doesn't need to displace as much water and so it will float at a higher level and so what you can see on this scale here is that in fact the lower positions on the scale correspond to a higher density of uh, fluid so let's see this in action So here it's floating in methanol and I'm getting a reading of about 800 kilograms per cubic meter. Right? So this is uh, uh, methanol. The other thing to note is that the uh, spacing on this scale is uh, constant. The reason for that is that this object has a constant uh, cross section. So we'll take it out of the methanol. I'll dry it on these towels and then we'll place it into the water and you can see here that it's floating quite a bit higher and if I read the scale you can see that it says 1000 kilograms per cubic meter which is the density of water and so we can use this effect of buoyancy to convert a density measurement for a fluid into a simple linear scale and for those of you that like scotch whiskey this is in fact how they measure the alcohol content of, uh, uh, of scotch um, they calibrate the scale a little differently what they call it is the specific gravity um, but you can use that uh, you, you measure the specific gravity which is essentially the density of the whiskey and that tells you the how much of the uh, fluid is alcohol versus how much is water because water and alcohol have different densities and so by measuring the density of the mixture you know the concentration of alcohol that you have for your scotch um, you can also use it for measuring the concentration of sugars and other solutions uh, uh, such as uh, salt water you can measure the concentration of salt in water so you can see that buoyancy is a very useful uh, phenomenon in terms of measuring uh, fluid densities
Okay, so buoyancy can lead to some counterintuitive examples. And we've got a demonstration here that shows this. So what I've got here is I've got a metal beam, and on each end of the metal beam I've got a container filled with water, and inside the water you should be able to see a little ball that's floating on the end of a string. So this ball has a density that's less than the density of water, so it's trying to float to the surface, but it's tied down with a piece of string. Now, if I had a ball on the end of a piece of string uh, here in the air, uh, where the ball was a lot more dense than the air, so it, it, it falls down, and I whirl this around, then you could well imagine that as I accelerate, the ball moves, as I move, make it move faster and faster and faster around in a circle, the ball will move away from the center of the circle because to make it move in a circle, I have to provide a centripetal acceleration towards the center of rotation. And so what happens is the ball wants to move in a straight line and so it moves away from the center of rotation until the string's tension provides enough force to provide the necessary acceleration in towards the the center. So what you might expect here is that this floating sphere, when I start to rotate uh, this system around the center, uh, center of rotation here, what you might expect is that these balls will move to the outside. So let's see what happens when we do set it in rotation. So what I hope you can see is that in fact the exact opposite is happening and the balls that are floating are moving towards the center of rotation. They're moving in the opposite direction to that which you'd expect. Now, you can also do this demonstration if you have a helium balloon in a car or on the bus, and when the bus or the car sets off and accelerates forwards, the helium balloon will actually move forward as well, which of course is the opposite to what you'd expect if you had a weight hanging on a string. Now the reason for this is that when I'm rotating it like this, I'm setting up a pressure gradient in the fluid, and the pressure gradient is least pressure here and most pressure at the back, just like a gravitational field where I have the least pressure on top and most pressure at the bottom, because the gravitational field, if you remember, is expressed as an acceleration. Well, here I'm generating, if you like, a fake gravitational field due to the rotation, where we have the least acceleration here and the most acceleration at the, far, at the outside, and so that generates a pressure gradient that pushes this floating ball in towards the center of rotation, and so the object behaves in the opposite to which you'd expect. The op moves in the opposite direction to that which you'd expect. And while it's probably a bit, little bit difficult to see here on the uh, camera, at the bottom of these flasks, there's actually a ball that's sunk. It's more dense than the liquid. And that moved in the direction that you'd expect. It moves to the outside because the weight is greater than the buoyancy force uh, that the ball experiences. And so that behaves exactly as you would expect. So one last time. Okay, so that's it for fluid statics. Uh, we've discussed the properties of static fluids, such as pressure and density, and we've also shown how we can measure both pressure and density using simple length measurements and the phenomena that we've observed with fluids. However, we've skipped over one very important property of fluids, and that is that fluids can flow. So that's what we're going to be covering in our next set of lectures. So until then, cheers.